marketing communications. I think it's a great moment for artists, emerging artists and artists in general, because you can do so much with so little in terms of uh, communicating your vision to the public. I do think it's really good when you're marketing your artwork to um, balance uh, someone's, balance the kind of ideas and the values of the art industry, the art market with um, the public. I see lots of artists that are self-represented and they're really very speaking to this public audience, but you want to appeal to the art industry um, you know, equally um, because they do have different value sets, they have different um, aesthetics, and it's really good to um, strategize and position yourself between those, those two elements. Whether you have a full-time dealer or a part-time dealer, your website is a reflection of, of you and your brand. So your website's essential. Um, it is, I, I spend half of my day on artists' websites and Google re researching because there is no documentation around many of the things an artist we're working with, um, especially if they're self-represented. Branding is important. Social media, I think it's an amazing, uh, uh, amazing technology that you can harness all its powers. I would just say to artists, edit yourself. Artists who post the same thing every day, I want to take them off my Facebook page. I don't want to see you eating your sandwich. Um, but I would like to see something maybe once a day on your Instagram um, and something that's really effective. So be judicious with yourself. I think. Um, things like Instagram are disruptive technologies. I am seeing artists get shows, sell artwork through Instagram. It's becoming a viable alternative marketplace, or if nothing else, a lead sourcing ability for dealers and collectors to look at your work. Maybe they'll purchase it, you know, from you or directly or from, uh, from a dealer, but it's becoming uh, a go-to spot for sure. So. Um, I think it has incredible upside for artists that are using it well. Also crowdsourcing. I'm seeing so many artists working in public sphere that are using crowdsourcing, um, you know, generating $20,000 in a couple of months in order to help actualize their vision. All I'd say with crowdsourcing is when you do, you know, um, Indiegogo, be really um, concrete, even play it out maybe with someone who works in marketing. Because people like to participate, but they also like to benefit in some way. So have a very strategic plan of levels of contribution. And it's amazing what, what artists who are effective using um, Indiegogo or crowds, other crowdsourcing ha have done. And they've brought works to life in the public domain that a curator didn't have the vision to do, uh, a dealer didn't have the time to do, um, and you know that's what has been so amazing for me to work with Five Point Artists, is they did this every day on their own with their own vision to push the boundaries of street art and graffiti art. And it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's creative capital, and it's, it's what everybody gets involved in art for. I mean, that's why we all participate in this field, <coughs> is to kind of expand our understanding and our sensibility about art and creative practices. So one of the things when you're at the late stage um, of your career you might want to think of, and I've seen very effective ways of artists later stages in their lives thinking very concrete and very strategically about setting up trusts or foundations. Um, it's really important to understand if you're going to do that, that you have to think about it during your lifetime. And um, you really have to uh, think very concretely and pragmatically about expenses that are associated with. Art Info did this really interesting study, and I just put this up uh, by way of illustration, of looking at um, six major artist foundations. Now these are blue chip, what we call classic contemporary in the art market now. These are Warhol, Lichtenstein, um, Calder. These are foundations that have huge income levels um, and also offer amazing grants. The Andy Warhol Foundation offers amazing grants to art historians and artists alike. So they're big organizations. But as you can see, these are all the expense lines you have to consider if you're going to do something in a very formalized organizational level. Officers and directors, um, other employee expenses, health care, I would assume, which we know is rising every day. Um, employee benefits, legal fees, 
other, the study wasn't um, very clear, but look at that other line, 13 to 65% expense ratio of other. I would think that's inventory management, storage. These things really can add up if you have uh, a large um, you know, output of, of, of your work. And then others are zero to 45 in terms of offering crash gr cash grants. Now, you can't accomplish this unless you have income. And so you need to really think very um, carefully about what your projected income is. I mean, are you selling work consistently? Do you have consistent representation? Uh, whether you're, I know many artists that sell work more consistently on eBay than they do with dealers, but they have an income stream that they can rely on to some extent. And also planning for the future. Some of the best scenarios I've seen is where artists who were maybe not represented, maybe had a moment, um, but they set up before their death, um, you know, and they put away funds to set it up, and at the time of their death, it transferred into a trust situation, and the money was then available to um, plan and set up a trust. Remember, a trust is something that you um, hold, a, a one party holds the ownership of the works, and other parties are authorized to act upon them, the third, uh, and then there's a beneficiary. That's one kind of scenario. A foundation is an organization where the foundation actually owns your, your artwork or the, the, the proceedings, and they have a lot more. And there's many different uh, considerations in what you want to set up. Either way, you have to consider that. I also see collectors and some artists putting things into FLPs, which is a family limited partnership. And when a family limited partnership, uh, it goes into a, a kind of a, a holding company and then multiple um, family members might be involved and they basically are like shareholders. And you know there are tax benefits and burdens associated with that. So if you're at that level, the most important thing is to build a team, a network of people that are reliable and trustworthy for the duration of your life and thereafter. Um, a team that will honor your vision. I think I see a lot of people, and I'm sure you've heard many stories, they make very personal decisions of who they choose, but I think it's really important to choose people that you're loyal to and loyal to you, but also are great professionals because the art market has become incredibly professionalized, and we've seen all these um, egregious um, the Cy Twombly estate, I don't know if you've read about that. We've seen kind of egregious uses of um, uh, an artist's funds and funding used for, you know, you know personal uh, benefit. And it's really important to think 30 years from now who is a great professional as well as understands my artwork. A state should be funded upon the death. You do have tax implications when there's an estate situation. An artist's estate usually has to pay taxes um, on the value, and then you can donate it. Um, that's an appraisal cost. If you have your inventory already complete, that'll be very, very easy for your heirs or for the trust or foundation you may be giving it to. But it's really important that as part of that, whether it's a trust, a foundation or a FLP, you have clear directives, people understanding what your wishes are, um, past your lifetime, you have a mission statement, um, you know what you'd like to loan to, people understand. I see lots of artists in states, whether they be Salawit, really struggling with how do we properly honor um, you know, our artists that we're caring for, um, but also be realistic about the current challenges in our environment. And it's really helpful if you have um, honest dialogues in your lifetime and leave clear directives. Um, marketing concerns, you know, are there certain dealers that you don't want to work with? Are there certain institutions that you don't want to work with? Is there a way your work should never be presented? You have to really communicate that to your team or even if it's one entrusted person, um, whether it's your daughter or your son, they, they really need to understand that. And restoration concerns, I see that also uh, is a big area of um, question and a big area where there's a lot of um, misunderstanding because artists are makers, they're not necessarily preservers. And many artists don't really want to conserve their own artwork because how you conserve something versus making, they're very, very different practices. But certainly you can set it up where you know the boundaries of limits, when you want to work, um, how you want to conserve, what it should look like, 
And with multimedia artists, this is particularly challenging because we never know how all these things will age out, how they will play into the landscape, whether copyright laws will change and everything of that. So you want to empower, empower those that, are your, that you're leaving your legacy to, to really care for your ideas and um, by being judicious and leaving lots of documentation and clear directives. Um, that's the best you can hope for. One of the things that we see at POBA often is that we get requests uh, about the value of work and the works are not identified by the artists themselves. So I wanted to ask you if you had any tips, even for just folks who have no idea whether their works will be considered in the future, what they need to do to make sure that they have identified themselves as the creator of the work, right. on the work, around the work, or in a manner that can be easily followed for somebody looking at it at some time in the future? Well, obviously, you know, things like signature, hand marking, labels. Um, how about a simple label you can buy at Staples? Front back, does that uh, Back is good. You always want to put things back on stretchers, you know, make sure everything, as um, Glenn was speaking to, everything you use is archival and asset free. Um, Having an inventory system, you know, um, it could be as sophisticated as an online, you know, um, organization called Collector Systems. It's an online system which you can uh, manage from any platform to a written notebook um, of everything numbered. I mean, if you can number them, identify them, put your personal markings. Uh, one of the things I'm always amazed at is be consistent. The consistency of your signature, of your markings, of your labeling, of your identifying can help codify knowledge around it um, and um, eventually be able to be part of your authentication process. Um, so if it's clear and it's consistent um, and you know, always use archival materials. I'm amazed at how many people use like non-sharpie markers, um, labels that fall off. Uh, don't put things on the back of your work. You know, if it, they're, they're paintings, they can transfer uh, through the front of your work. So consistency, your hand markings. The truth is in the day of reproduction, collectors, um, authenticators, appraisers, advisors, we love the hand of artists, whether it be a video artwork, you know, now video artists now, you know, kind of create um, individual boxes, which are proprietary boxes. So they don't worry about anybody ripping off their video piece because that's not owning the work. That's owning the images, which is actually very loyal to the creation and the beginning of video art as, as a disruptive medium, right? That's what it was all about. But they have this, you know, the collector, the owner of one of those six of editions has a beautiful box or you know a significant um, detailed uh, script or uh, you know issue invoices issue paperwork with everything um, whether it's going out of your studio and coming into your studio photograph it if it's you you know if you don't have time to do it properly just you know everybody's it, it has an I, I, iPod and iPad and uh, you know uh, it can happen in five seconds. Just send it in an email. I mean, it can be that simple so it doesn't get lost out there. We have heard from many people today that it's important to photo document. And the nature of the photo documentation I heard especially from you really makes a difference in uh, not only promoting artwork during your lifetime but in helping people after you go uh, to promote your work or preserve it. So I was wondering if you could just give a few tips about what to include, believe it or not, what to include, like issues like sure. indirect light, so, a reflection right. of glass, those right. kinds of things that make a difference. Okay, so like this, is, these are cataloging. So, you know, in our age of inventory, people don't think professional catalogers exist, but actually it's quite hard sometimes to capture your artwork, especially if it's framed. So you want to capture the front. You might want to capture a close-up of the materials. Um, you want to capture the back, any markings. If it's an installation, many, many different views. You might want to capture all the different um, elements within that installation. Um, and I would say that an average iPhone for documentation of condition is okay. You know, 12, uh, 16 um, uh, megab uh, megabytes is okay. But ideally, 
for your inventory, your lifetime inventory, you want to create a setting where you have raking light, consistent light, it's set up, it's stable, it's uh, photographed outside the frame if it's an artwork. Um, and again, do it consistently. Save it, back it up off site. So many times, nothing's backed up off site. And personally, um, I, uh, you know, I may use the cloud, but I also am very, very antiquated. Um, I want uh, a flash drive. I want something off-site. Um, many of my collectors put all the original documentation, meaning your authenticity statement or your invoice or a gallery's invoice, which documents all that, which plays into provenance, okay? When an artwork goes to sale, we want to see, was the Donald Judd sold by Paula Cooper? If it's sold by Paula Cooper and it wasn't cataloged properly, it's much easier to uncover. So many of my collectors keep all of that original documentation in a safety deposit box or an offsite. So, you know, people treasure works by artists, whether, you know, you're a revered branded artist or, you know, you're an artist that's still emerging. People love it and you should take the same care and consideration. I think what happens is everybody gets very um, rushed and it becomes a, a lesser priority with keeping up with grants and keeping up with, you know, maybe a day job, but you have to spend the time to plan to do that. And that's why it's really good to plan it. Do you have any advice to working artists about how in their record keeping or in their uh, documentation or anything, they would distinguish between their own works and the works they've collected of other people that they have in their possession? Yeah, I mean, even collaborative works. Um, I'm, I'm recently unraveling a Calder work, uh, which was claimed by a dealer to be an authenticated Calder because it was made um, by uh, another artist and we had to go to the original source material um, and the original drawings executed by Calder and we found out by looking at those preserved drawings um, he may have collaborated in the idea phase with this artist mm. but at the end the artist executed the work separately from Calder and Calder went out on his own and executed a similar work mm. but very different in tone and temperament but it all went back to his notebooks and having those notebooks. So I would say, keep it all separate. So even in a simple thing, like in an artist's inventory, you could put your artwork, your collection, and then you know documentation, archival documentation, and have it as kind of three different buckets. And um, you know those are things if an artist, if you you know do become a, a legacy artist, um, that maybe come or donate it to the MoMA.